you're not in the wrong uh, room. Uh, we're going from the scale uh, of astrophysics and the scales of weather pattern to the arm length scale, the intimate scale of art, and to the time scale of human ingenuity and human experience. Uh, not every work in an art museum is a masterpiece. Some of them were not even created as art as we intend the word today. Um, this that you see here is a Japanese print from May of 1881. All Japanese prints from the Meiji period are stamped with the date and the month they were created, which is very important for us. Um, you can look at it under many levels of examination. An art historian will carry out formal analysis to mine data from it, to, to, to read information and meaning. Uh, figures in a natural setting, mostly women, some men, all of them Japanese. The men are wearing Western uniform. The ladies are wearing traditional attire, uh, possibly springtime, cherry blossom season. That is one way of reading it. And it's telling you already many things. Uh, it's very pretty also. The colors are um, stupendous. It's an object of high technology. You could not do something like this in Europe at that time. And it would take 10 other years for reaching this level of quality in the mass production of color images anywhere in the world with the invention of color lithography in Europe. Uh, this is a simple woodlock print. The image was produced in 2,000 copies maybe at a very low cost. It was not art, it was illustration. I'm getting to the point. You can read it as an historian at a deeper level. The man with the most uh, flamboyant uniform is the Meiji Emperor, the man who transformed Japan from feudal society into a modern global power. The Western uniform is a symbol of this transformation. He opened up what was a closed country to uh, commerce with the West. The small boy, a son from a concubine. The little boy in the arm of the two ladies in the front is the legitimate heir. Um, he would be the father of Emperor Hirohito, whom we may remember. Um, the ladies are wearing traditional attire that dates back to the seventh century. They shave their eyebrows and they paint them higher on the forehead, just like in the Heian court <laughs> of Nara. The man, however, was ordered to wear Western dress to signify that Europe, that Japan was a Western global power. 10 years from there, the Empress says, we too will wear, when at court, Western dress as a uniform. When they go home and retire from the service, they would go back to kimono. Now that is the deeper level of reading an historian would uh, achieve. There's something more interesting. If you consider this a document, a piece of material evidence, and as a chemist, you investigate it with the tools of analytical chemistry, which are not simple, by the way, because you can't just tear it apart to analyze the materials, you'll discover something very interesting. A quintessential Japanese art form, the woodblock print, a quintessential scene, cherry blossom we, uh, viewing at Ueno Park. The site still exists. You can go and see it in Tokyo. There are little cute swan-shaped boats in the little lake behind there. That's where you take your girlfriend or boyfriend for an outing in Tokyo. Um, not a single color pigment used in this print was available in Japan uh, traditionally. Uh, Prussian blue of the sky arrived in Japan 60 years before this print was made. Pink, it's eosine. The print dates 1881. Eosine was synthesized in Europe in 1871. So uh, the light red is cochineal carmine. It came from Mexico through Cortes and Charles V. It arrived in Japan in 1869. Um, the violet is crystal violet, synthesized by Hoffmann and Caro in 1865 in Germany. Every material is a fresh import. This work of art is made possible by those new imports. Now, the question is, were they using those materials because they like bright color, 
was this print made possible by those materials? Or were those materials imported because they wanted to print this? These are all questions, as I say, at the intersection of materials and meaning that we can investigate when we take these, doc these works as documents for um, historical and scientific analysis. Tools for us are very important. As I say, when you look at a work of art, you cannot do traditional analytical chemistry. The question of sample size, and possibly no sample at all, is very important. Most of my career has coincided with the availability of Raman spectroscopy in, uh, in our field, which meant that the instruments were finally uh, relatively inexpensive. Relatively inexpensive is something that my director would disagree with, but since I'm the one who's raising the money to buy them, uh, they are relatively inexpensive. You can do things with Raman that you cannot do with anything with any other technique. So look at the object I'm uh, focusing on there. That is a, um, a Renaissance pa a patent, a shallow bowl used during the Eucharist, um, from Germany. It's what we call reverse painted glass. The painting is on the outside, on the underside of the glass bowl, and it's then sealed with a layer of wax. So the painting materials are protected by the glass and by the opaque wax at the back. There's no way you can get to it. You cannot analyze it with, say, X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy because you just get the signal from the glass. With Raman, we go through the glass, we recover the signal of the materials, and we can analyze it. So Raman is um, quite a valuable technique. Uh, it suffers from two big problems. It's not a very sensitive uh, effect. It's about one photon in a billion that undergoes Raman scattering. And whenever you use a source as bright as a laser, certainly not as bright as two black holes colliding, um, you are going to excite fluorescence. Anything that can luminesce will luminesce. And there are a lot of impurities in the samples we look at that will luminesce, um, obliterating the Raman signal. That is even worse if you look at classes of materials such as those um, organic pigments that are shown in the um, Japanese print that are intrinsically fluorescent. These are um, small organic molecule dyes that have very strong absorption in the visible range and are being used for, we'll see how many thousand years, to impart color to uh, substrates. Uh, they're very important because they come from specific plants or insects giving us information on geographic origin or, or uh, availability across time. It's even more interesting when you get to the synthetic dyes that appeared from about 1856 um, for one very interesting reason. First of all, there are many in many different shades and each one comes with a date of birth. They have patent dates. We know when they were commercialized. We know who was selling them. So if you can pair dyes that you identify to works of art, you get dates and you can cross-correlate those dates. You can mine information in a deeper way. Um, <coughs> those dyes are all extraordinarily fluorescent. Again, they're used in small quantities. They have no uh, elemental uh, marker, you know, such as cobalt, copper, like mercury, like inorganic pigments. So um, to identify them, we turn to surface enhanced Raman scattering. That's a technique that probably many of you know. Uh, it's very simply the uh, giant enhancement of Raman scattering intensity, which is experienced by molecules adsorbed on atomic, atomically rough uh, metallic surfaces. Uh, I remember one of the prizes this morning was awarded for work uh, dealing with plasmonic uh, fields and nanoparticles, same stuff. Uh, the Raman, F, the, the SIRS was observed first in 1974, not recognized as such, and it was then um, Albert and Creighton and Jean Mer and Van Dyne who properly characterized it. Um, Van Dyne actually worked uh, with us on many uh, of these applications when he discovered that it was something that could be used for art. Um, on the right side, I'm actually putting my own timeline of SIRS the applications that are specifically to the world of art. And certainly, they're interesting to me, certainly they told us something um, on, on works of art that we couldn't tell before. But I also want to open a little parenthesis here. 
there's a lot more that we learned about the application of surface enhanced Raman scattering as an analytical chemistry tool by looking at art than what was done by my excellent colleagues on the physics and physical chemistry field. Uh, and I think because they were looking at the physics of surface nine Raman scattering and we were looking at how it performed in the real world on a host of different molecules. The field of artistic production is extremely varied and diverse. If essentially anything that can give you a beautiful result and it's somewhat durable has been used by artists and human craftsmen over the course of recorded <coughs> history. Right now, um, this is a technique that in the last 10 years have, has become relatively commonplace and almost routine in, uh, in our field uh, because it can identify these materials at sample sizes that are not matched by any other techniques. And the nearest competition is uh, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, a very powerful technique that requires, however, a sample generally 10, 20, 100 times larger. And we'll see how small what we do. The other beauty of surface enhanced Raman scattering is that it is very simple to do and very fast. Um, the way we develop the technique, we can go from sampling um, the top there where you see a needle to spectrum, the bottom, in about half an hour. And the sample sizes that you can see there, uh, the, the scale is in micron, um, are very small. The, what you see there are samples that are actually enormous by our own standard, but it was very easy to take pictures. Some applications, some examples. Um, pigments dispersed in oil to form glazes, that is transparent color layers that are used to add depth to uh, an um, underlayer, underlaying color. And here you see sh the shadows from um, a painting by Cezanne. The sample is actually 20 micron, it's a little red dot. Uh, the two spectra, the dotted spectrum is a reference spectrum, the red is the spectrum from one colorant, uh, madder, which is a natural <laughs> dye. Um, the match is very clear and the signal is extremely intense even though the amount of sample is very small. Remember, dyes are used because they are economically convenient to use. That means that you need very few molecules to get a lot of color. Otherwise, it would cost too much. So there's a, actually very little sample, very little analyte in that little dot. We worked on ways to make our nanoparticles, the supports, the atomically rough supports that we, the nanoscale supports that we, um, that we use, um, using microwave supported reductions that give a very uh, narrowly dispersed uh, set of nanoparticles that are quite, um, quite stable. The spectra are um, extremely reproducible. If you have done SIRS, if you're familiar with spectroscopy, you know that SIRS is always characterized as a technique that is of pure reproducibility. Um, that is not the case. Uh, we can do search match of spectral libraries, simplifying analysis. And we come up with ways to move the, uh, the envelope in ways that are even more uh, palatable for museum directors and museum curators that are uh, allowing us to sample or look at these works. Um, so the normal procedure is you take a 10, 20, 30 micron sample from a work of art, you coat it with silver nanoparticles, a silver colloid. Um, but could you do it differently? So here we've, uh, we've worked on doing gel sampling. So this is a gel, it's actually the material you use for soft contact lenses. It can take up uh, polar solvents and it's, um, it's used to extract a small amount of colorant without physically removing any substrates. Now you're going to say, if you look at the bottom uh, picture, you change it a little bit. The color has changed. Of course, we did it because we wanted to, uh, to see it on the picture. And I want to show you how in the forensic field, which is um, a, a field that is quite interesting to this type of analysis, how they do uh, ink analysis like this. You make a hole in your check or forge signature, which is not exactly something we could do. Uh, we can actually do it in a way that doesn't modify the color. The two curves that you see are before and after gel sampling that show 
the, uh, the actual color and the delta E, which is the parameter that measures uh, color change, is below what the human eye can see. But other applications are, um, I think, where we are pushing it even further. We're using light, so why take a needle to sample from your work of art or to look in your sample, in your fragment of interest, when I make a physical needle, a metal needle, when you can use light itself. So here what we're doing is we're doing laser ablation source. We're using a focus ultraviolet laser pulse to desorb the analyte of interest, condense it over a silver nano island decorated quartz window, and then reading that. And what we can do in that case is um, spatially selective uh, search sampling. So you see a painting by Giorgione. In the middle, you see a cross-section. So that's a stratigraphic sample that shows the layers of colors as put down by the artist. And the little circle is a 15 micron uh, dot where we sampled the color using a laser pulse. And you can see how the spectrum obtained ma matches quite well uh, uh, a reference. So, once you have this type of tool, you can start probing objects to extract meaning from materials. And you can do it with a lot of things. Now, um, I don't need to tell you that this is a document, a document that you can read if you're fluent, fluent in ancient Egyptian. It's the pap papyrus lancing. It's um, a 20th dynasty uh, papyrus from about 1200 BC. And it's interesting because, as read by an, an historian, Renate Germer, um, it's the first uh, description in recorded history of a very interesting chemical process, the process by which you take an organic molecule and you chemically attach it to a natural polymer, such as wool, silk, or leather collagen. It's a process we call dyeing, and it's one of the oldest technological processes to create beautiful objects, to create functional objects, clothing that's richly decorated. This is how our, uh, the leather in our purses or shoes is colored. This is how our ties are colored and all that. And this specific passage that says, his hands are red with dye, like one who is smeared with his own blood, has been read according to um, linguistic and paleolinguistic criteria to mention exactly the word dye, so this type of organic molecule. And it has been shown to be this oldest description of the very specific chemical process. Two minutes, right? I have my own. <laughs> Technology. This is also a document. Now what's interesting, is that this document is 800, old, 800 years older than papyrus lancing. It's precious, it's just a fragment of leather this big, but it's 4,000 year old total. And so we were able to extract, it looks like one of your asteroids, no, you didn't have asteroids. We were able to extract uh, a 20 micron fragment and analyze it, proving that the colorant was indeed Mother Lake, uh, an extra from Mother Rubia Tinctorum. And so just reading the object, as it were, a, domu a document that you can read if you just know the language it's written in. There's um, a nice corollary to this story. <coughs> the, the whole document, um, it's actually an, a hilarious document, and as translated by Blackman and Pete in uh, 1925, um, it's a letter written by a scribe to his student. And he's saying, you shouldn't be like you're doing. You don't want to work hard. You should work hard because the professional scribe that you will learn will make you like a god. It's not as bad as the other profession. And he starts telling what all of the other professions are in terrible terms, the cobbler, the person who makes shoes and leather objects. His hands, he smells bad. Uh, that's as a result of using tanning agents. Uh, his hands are always stained uh, with this dye. And 
I like to say that the, the scribe thought he had an advantage, his words was, would last forever. He could transfer his experience, he could transfer his thought, thanks to the gift of writing, which was a gift from the gods. Um, but now, thanks to the gift of chemistry, we were able to actually give something back to the cobbler and show how incredible the science that the Egyptian cobbler, or the one who was doing the dyes, um, was doing. It's, uh, it's with us because we were able to read this document. And thank you. <laughs>